If someone brought up the topic of aliens, the last thing that should come to mind is New Jerusalem and the coming kingdom of our Messiah. The topic of extraterrestrials surfaces thoughts of flying saucers, little green men, invasions, abductions, and much more. Over the past 120 years, Hollywood has been busy at work forming the minds of the masses through media. Little did we know, they are preparing the world to reject and fight against our Messiah city that will come down from above. Seems far-fetched, however, stay with us and I think you may see the agenda at hand. Shalom and welcome brothers and sisters. Welcome to the Parable of the Vineyard YouTube live stream. My name is Adam, your host. And tonight we're going to be talking about a pretty interesting topic. Aliens, the agenda, New Jerusalem. And if you listen to the introduction, you kind of understand where I'm going with this. I believe there's a real reason for the Hollywood alien agenda. Why? Since 1902, they've been well preparing the world for an alien invasion. It kind of sounds crazy right? However, truly stick with me and I think you may see what's going on here. Before we get started, let's quick prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you and just bless you and thank you for all things. Thank you for sending your son that we may have eternal life. Thank you for revealing the truth in these last days, Father. And I pray that anyone that would be watching or listening to this, that eyes and ears would be open to the truth of the agenda out there, but more importantly, the truth of you and your son and following you with all of our heart. We love you and bless you in Yeshua's mighty name. Amen. All right, so what we're going to be going over tonight is in article form. It's going to be at parableofthevineyard.com. I'll leave it as a link in the description box and as a pinned comment below. That way, if you want to go back and review some of the scripture or some of the references uh, that I've used, you can go back and do that. Or if you just want to study this whole thing at your own pace, everything we're going to be covering tonight uh, is going to be here in this article, minus a few comments uh, for myself here and there uh, as we go through it. So with that being said... Let's get started. Let's talk about the real alien agenda because I'm here to tell you that all these movies and TV shows that are made are not just for money and for your entertainment. So this was the introduction. Uh, we don't have to read that again. So <sighs> aliens. So let's first let's talk about predictive programming. Before we begin, we need to start here. Many of you are already aware of this tactic called predictive programming. However, just in case you are new, predictive programming is the way that the enemy likes to conduct its own version of prophecy and beliefs. 9-11 is a perfect example of it. So here's some of the subliminal messaging that was put forth in movies and TV shows and media in general to kind of desensitize and prepare the public for what was going to happen. Look at the years of these things in these movies, right? 93, 94, 97, 83, 76. Look at these different things and how it's the same thing being shown, just kind of preparing and really prophesying to the people. I mean, look at that one. Come on, come on. I mean, look at that one. Really? I remember watching this, too. Any case, uh, this was a big one, right? 9-11. Anyways, <clears throat> they also conditioned the minds over the years with the current crisis, or actually, uh, as the time of this, uh, uh, this uh, study, um, this thing is kind of going away for now. Who knows? But this movie was a like a perfect example. Uh, this movie, Contagion, is about a virus that starts in Hong Kong and plagues the whole world. The This thing here it becomes the savior. And that's kind of the story, how it played out here. And they've been prepping people for this for years with all kinds of movies about uh, pandemics, plagues, those kind of things. So mass media, news, television, movies, books, and even music and more have been shaping societal changes over the past few centuries. What you see and hear goes into your thoughts. Thoughts become words. Words become actions. This is literally Satan's tool to lead the world astray and to have people believe things his way. So this is how the enemy works. Right? This is mass media. 
Through media, movies, TV, books, false flag operations, they are able to desensitize the public and prepare them for societal changes. When the enemy controls what the people believe, they control the narrative as well. This is going to play into the whole alien agenda. Before we begin, I do not endorse nor do I encourage watching any Hollywood television or movies. In fact, I would recommend staying far away from them. If one is to watch anything, much is discretion, much discretion is required. Movies and TV shows have been the most effective way of brainwashing you. Only if you are fully grounded in your walk and faith would I even venture to watch, even for investigative purposes. Regardless, the enemy is very crafty about wanting to gain a foothold in your life through your eyes and ears or any chink in your armor, so beware. And I'm here to tell you, <clears throat> I believe I'm pretty firm in my walk. I watched a, a few things. I hadn't watched movies in years, and I watched a few movies leading up to this, and ugh, I didn't. I just did not miss them. It was just like icky. So anyways, we'll talk about that a little bit later uh, regarding like Eternal. I watched Eternals, and I was just like, man, can I have my three hours back? Anyways, the alien agenda, right? Why? Why? Why would Hollywood even care about our Messiah's kingdom, right? So what we're going to put together here is why the alien agenda and what this has to do with our Messiah's kingdom. You may think it's completely unrelated. Stick with me, please. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth, and just to back up, we know in Revelation 13 that the dragon Satan gave power to the beast. So the beast is literally his kingdom. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. We know who sits on the horse. It's our Messiah. That was Revelation 19.19. So think about it. He, the, Satan and the beast, his system, his whole, his kingdom is able to literally get the entire world to fight or at least attempt to fight our Messiah and his kingdom. Did you ever wonder how the devil would be able to trick the whole world into fighting against Messiah? Like, literally, like, how does he do that? Is it like, I mean, how could he do that? We spent quite a bit of time digging into this subject a few months ago. If you have not yet seen it, after this video, I would highly recommend it. It's called The Coming War. You are the enemy. So here's a passage from 2nd Ezra, it's also known as 4th Ezra, which was included in the 1611 KJV. So for those of you out there that are like, I, I only believe what's in the Bible, well, I'm here to tell you this used to be in the Bible and they took it out in the 1800s. This was considered canon and scripture until the late 1800s. Ironically, it is books like this and many others that bust wide open the coming deception. I believe our Heavenly Father allowed this to happen to bring about the end times because if all the people were still reading these, this book in churches right now, Satan wouldn't be able to fool even believers. So why? <clears throat> After this, I looked and behold, an innumerable, innumerable multitude of men were gathered together from the four winds of heaven to make war against the man who came up out of the sea. We're going to explain who that is here in a second. And I looked and behold, he carved out for himself a great mountain and flew upon it. In the book of Second uh, Daniel chapter 2, we learn that this great mountain, this stone, this mountain cut without hands, is his kingdom. So Messiah flew upon, he cut out his kingdom and flew upon it. And I tried to see the region or place from which the mountain was carved, but I could not. Why? Because it was not cut with human hands. After this, I looked and behold, all who had gathered together against him to wage war with him were much afraid, yet dared to fight. So they're like, oh, but we're still going to fight you because we think you're the enemy. To Ezra 13, 5 through 8. So some people might take offense with the passage that states coming up from the sea because we see that in Revelation also relating to the beast. I said, O sovereign master, explain this to me. Why did I see the man coming up from the heart of the sea? <clears throat> this is just a parable. He said to me, just as no one can explore or know what is in the depths of the sea, so no one on this earth can see my son or those who are with him except in the time of his day to Ezra 13, 51 through 52. So this is just a parable about Messiah being hidden, just like the things in the depths of the sea are hidden from us. Messiah is hidden from us, except for in the end times when he is revealed at his second coming. Satan's task is to get the whole world to oppose and fight our Messiah when he comes. He will unite the world under one banner and one cause. And let's hear a little excerpt, a couple excerpts here from uh, Ronald Reagan, former president of the United States. I couldn't help at one point in my discussions with privately with General Secretary Gorbachev. When you stop to think that we're all God's children, wherever we may live in the world. I couldn't help but say to him, just think how easy 
his task and mine might be in these meetings that we held if suddenly there was a threat to this world from some other species from another planet uh, outside in the universe we'd forget all the little local differences that we have between our countries and we would find out once and for all that we really are all human beings here on this earth together well I don't suppose we can wait for some alien race to come down and threaten us but I think that between us we can bring about that realization in our obsession with antagonisms of the moment we often forget how much unites all the members of humanity perhaps we need some outside universal threat to make us recognize this common bound I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world and yet I ask you is not an alien force already among us what could be more alien to the universal aspirations of our peoples than war and the threat of war I think maybe I'd answer it this way I I keep in my frustration sometimes you know actually if you count some of the things going on in smaller countries and all there have been about 114 wars since World War II but I've often wondered what if all of us in the world discovered that we were threatened by an outer a power from outer space from another planet wouldn't we all of a sudden find that we didn't have any differences between us at all we were all human beings citizens of the world and wouldn't we come together to fight that particular threat moving speech right well this is how he does it believe it or not and i'm gonna prove it to you today with scripture believe it or not messiah and his kingdom will be that threat this is also the reason for these wars that are taking place since the early 1900s they have been planning this moment problem reaction solution the hegelian dialectic because satan knows how this will play out they need war and the emotional reaction to be able to unite as one people also redirecting the face of who the enemy is we'll talk a lot about that here in just a bit in this case it will be messiah and his kingdom think about it how on earth could the whole world reject him at his second coming unless they were conditioned for centuries to do so Behold, the days are coming when the Most High will deliver those who are on the earth, and bewilderment of mind shall come over those who dwell on the earth. And they shall plan to make war against one another, city against city, place against place, people against people, and kingdom against kingdom. And when these things come to pass, and the signs occur which I showed you before, then my son will be revealed whom you saw as a man coming up from the sea. And when all the nations hear his voice, every man shall leave his own land and the warfare that they have against one another, and an innumerable innumerable multitude shall be gathered together, as you saw, desiring to come and conquer him. So, wars have to happen first, all the conflict, 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 and then it's like, oh man, why are we fighting amongst each other? That's the enemy, just like Ronald Reagan said, an alien threat from outside of this, this earth. Remember Messiah said, my kingdom is not of this, of this earth? Well, one day his kingdom's going to come down here and rule this earth. But he will stand on top of Mount Zion. This is New Jerusalem. And Zion will come and be made manifest to all people, prepared and built, as you saw the mar- ma- mountain carved without hands. And we know that New Jerusalem is in the upper heavens, and one day it will descend down with Messiah. His whole kingdom will come down, prepared and ready and built. We're going to be talking a lot about this in a second, but I, I can't uh, stress this point enough, is that this is exactly what's going on. The, the worlds are, are are clashing with each other, especially with what's going on right now with the whole, this whole Russian-Ukraine thing. I mean, maybe it might die down and just be another just, you know, couple-week war or something. Or this may be the beginning of another big major conflict. I don't know. I haven't been told these things. But we know that war breaks out, and in the midst of war, Messiah comes and people put their war down and gather together against him. 
So, and he, my son, will reprove the assembled nations for their ungodliness. This was symbolized by the storm, which a lot of us know is coming, and will reproach them to their face with their evil thoughts and the torments with which they are to be tortured, which were symbolized by the flames, and will destroy them without effort by the Torah, this is the law, which was symbolized by the fire, 2 Ezra 13, 29 through 38. So, the point is, this is the reason for the alien agenda. Our Messiah will be coming down from heaven with his city and kingdom, New Jerusalem, and Satan will gather the world to attempt to make war with him. Sound familiar? It's pretty much a lot, it's a lot of the alien agenda movies. Now, some of the alien movies, you know, the aliens come down and they have peace and, you know, things like that. But most of them, they're here, they're coming to take over the world, which is what our Messiah is going to do. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Right, so the world is gathering together for this globe to be global citizens, to be one people. Right, you got people like these characters right here that are swooing the people over. Become global citizens, right? Yeah, these people are all part of the same group, same agenda. They want to unite as one, and they will use any means necessary. This is how they're going to do it. This is the Hegelian dialectic. Problem, reaction, solution, poverty, right? No poverty. This is the sustainable goals for Agenda 2030. No poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, quality education, gender, all these different things. Like, these things sound nice on the front. Like, like who, who wants poverty, right? But these families that run the world, there's like a handful of families that run the world that they own like 70% of the wealth. If they wanted to end poverty, they'd give away their, they'd give away their riches and spread the love as they'd say, and there wouldn't be any poverty. So that's the same thing with hunger, right? Anyways, so these things sound nice on, uh, on the, the surface, but they create these very problems so that there's a reaction from the public, and then they then offer the solution. But the overall solution is to gather together as one people, to break down the walls, right? To become one, one united world. And what's that one united world going to do? Well, they're going to go against our Messiah and his kingdom. So let's talk about the agenda now. Hollywood and the circle. This is the how. This is the how they're going to get people to go against Messiah and to, well, call good evil. Messiah, good. His kingdom, good. But they're going to call it evil. So this is the how. So Hollywood and the circle. The flying saucer, right? Why would Hollywood pick a flying circle or a disc to appear from space? Perhaps to show a superior technology that surpasses our understanding of flight and aerodynamics. Or maybe there's more to the story. Nevertheless, nearly 9 out of 10 alien movies portray something circular coming to Earth to take it over by force. Something our Messiah will lawfully do. Let's take a peek. I don't even know why I picked this one. This one was not really circular, but kind of. <laughs> we, of course, we know the flying saucer. I think, was this Prometheus? I don't remember what movie this was. Um, you've got, uh, of course, Armageddon, right? So not this isn't necessarily an alien spaceship that's circular, but there's there's always portrays this circle of an, in destruction with the Earth, right? This circle, something about this circle. This movie was it the arrival? So uh, real quick um, on Armageddon, after discovering that an asteroid the size of Texas is going to impact the Earth in less than a month, NASA recruits a misfit team of deep core drillers to save the planet. So it's interesting. The um, New Jerusalem is going to be actually much bigger than Texas, but it's you know it's still it's the same narrative. A massively large object is coming in the sky to really kind of destroy the planet. I mean, the planet, the 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 Earth. I mean, we'll talk about those scriptures. Messiah is going to come and bring judgment to this Earth. This is what they always portray the aliens to be doing. Except for movies like this, right? Movies like this, I think the arrival, the aliens were like nice or whatever. But uh, overall is they portray this circle coming from outer space. Uh, the Avengers series, right? These circles, the circle. Even though this didn't really play a whole narrative in it, there's something about this circle agenda, right? There's Thanos. This is who they portray our Elohim, our God to be some crazed villain right with his precious stones but the circle why always this circle the circle Thanos right this guy Thanos this is the big mean guy <clears throat> in the movie Thanos you know the guy that has ultimate power time travel invincibility doesn't need food or water wants to take over the world gathers his stones wants to destroy half the population and sit on the throne 
Avengers 2012, Earth's mightiest heroes must come together to learn to fight as a team if they are going to stop the mischievous Loki and his alien army from enslaving humanity. Listen, when Messiah comes with his kingdom, he's going to rule the entire Earth with a rod of iron. Satan's going to try to spin that as enslaving. People that love him and know him and love his ways are going to look at as as freedom. Guardians of the Galaxy 2014, a group of intergalactic criminals must uh, pull together to stop a fanatical warrior, I'm sorry, warrior with plans to purge the universe. Isn't that what our Messiah is going to do is purge the purge the earth of wicked wickedness of sin? Avengers, Affinity War, the Avengers and their allies must be willing to sacrifice all in an attempt to defeat the powerful Thanos before his blitz of devastation and ruin puts an end to the universe. Um, Battle Los Angeles, right? A circle coming to destroy the Earth. This is the thing, those battleship, these little circular things are destroying the Earth. It's close encounters of the third kind, right? This circular city comes down out of the sky. I think this is deep impact, right? This big circle, this wave of destruction. How about this one? I thought this was really interesting. <clears throat> I used to watch Star Wars, right? And how about the Death Star? The Death Star, right? It has a throne room. It's known as the Planet Killer. Scattered resistance joins together to destroy the threat. Sound familiar? Sounds like what we just read about in Two Esdras. Two Esdras. Right? This big circle thing comes to destroy the earth destroy planets if you will heaven and earth are about to collide we're gonna we're gonna talk about this right but why this circle this continuous circle circle <clears throat> so talking about heaven and earth colliding heaven is gonna come down to earth and there was war in heaven michael and the angels fought michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not Neither was there place found any more in heaven, and the dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan which deceives the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now, so at this time, right, when, when Satan is cast out, now is come salvation, and strength, and the kingdom of our Elohim, and the power of his Messiah, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our Elohim day and night. So literally, heaven and earth are about to collide. And that was Revelation uh, 12, 7 through 10. And in the days of these kings shall the Elohim set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to the other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and shall stand forever. For as much as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces, the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, this is all the nations, the great Elohim, the great God, has made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof is sure. Daniel 2, 44-45. So, literally, this rock cut without hands is coming to destroy this earth. And that's what these movies depict. Is this coming thing thing from, from the sky coming down to destroy the earth? Where was it in uh, right Armageddon? Right, coming down to destroy this earth, this big rock, this rock cut without hands, which is Messiah and His kingdom. They are subliminally trying to change the minds of the masses to think of our Messiah and His kingdom as the enemy. This is what He's doing. This is what they are doing. All right here's this movie Elysium. This is kind of an interesting one. In the year twenty one fifty four, the the very wealthy live on a man-made space station while the rest of the population resides on a ruined earth. A man takes on a mission that could bring equality to the polarized world. So literally, like down here on earth, it's like devastated um, by you know aliens or whatever it was. I can't remember. I haven't watched this movie in years. <clears throat> but like everybody's looking up here and like um, people have it good up in this circular city in the sky and they want to destroy it. Or eventually he wants to destroy it so um anyways it's just it's how they continuously portray this uh, i thought this was interesting that the bible talks about some firmaments this has one two three four five six seven it's kind of interesting 
And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months, and he opened his mouth in blasphemy against Elohim, against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. His tabernacle is literally heaven. It comes down to earth. Revelation 13, 5 through 6. And that's what they, that's what they do in these movies. They're like, oh, look, there's the enemy. Let's get it. Right? There's the enemy. Oh, there's the enemy. Let's get it. Right? There's the enemy. Let's get it. Why this Why this circle? Why the circle or this dome looking thing? Why the circle? Why the circle? Why the circle? Right? Uh, Independence Day. This is like this is like their go-to script for I believe what's what's going to go down. <clears throat> right? This the city or this mothership comes out of the sky in fire and flaming fire and the clouds on July 2nd, communication systems worldwide are sent into chaos by a strange, strange atmospheric interference, what people will call probably an EMP. It is soon learned by the military that a number of enormous objects are on a collision course with Earth. At first, I'm sorry, at first thought to be meteors, they are later re revealed to be gigantic spacecraft piloted by a mysterious alien species. After attempts to communicate with the aliens go nowhere, David Levinson, an ex-scientist turned cable technician, discovers that the aliens are going to attack major points around the globe in less than a day. On July 3rd, the aliens are all but obliterate New York, Los Angeles, and Washington, as well as Paris, London, Houston, and Moscow. The survivors are set out in convoys towards Area 51, a strange government testing ground where it is rumored the military has captured alien spacecraft of their own. The survivors devise a plan to fight back against the enslaving aliens. Right There it is again, enslaving aliens. And July 4th becomes the day humanity will fight for its freedom. July 4th is their Independence Day. So it's interesting in this movie you see that all the nations kind of like get together like hey let's let's join in together you know we have one common enemy let's let's plan together and let's do this let's fight them <clears throat> right but every time you see this circle this circle and he that overcomes and keeps my works unto the end to him will i give power over the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of a potter shall be broken to shivers even as i received of my father revelation 2:26 through 27 again when messiah comes he's going to shatter the nations he's going to destroy the nations and then he's going to rule it with a rod of iron and the people that are with him that overcome and have faith and obedience they're going to be with him but these movies try to spin that as enslavement Right? We don't want to be ruled by you. Right? Why this circle? Why these circles? For behold, Yahweh will come with fire and his chariots with a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by his sword will Yahweh plead with all flesh and the slain of Yahweh shall be many. Isaiah 66, 15 through 16. Right? When he comes, it's going to be with fire right? and vengeance, what these movies always show. And so they are, they, they are portraying our father and his son and their kingdom as that threat. This that's going to bring devastation. This huge circle is going to come out of the sky and bring devastation. Come ye, you nations, to hear and hearken, you people. Let the earth hear and all that is therein, the world and all things that come forth of it. For the indignation of Yahuwah is upon all nations. And just in case you're new, Yahuwah is just how we understand our Heavenly Father's name. What's commonly translated in the Bible as the Lord. Right? For the indignation of Yahweh is upon all nations, and his fury upon all their armies. He has utterly destroyed them. He has delivered them to the slaughter. Their slain also shall be cast out, and their stink shall come up out of their carcasses, and the mountains shall be melted with their blood. Listen, this is what's going to happen. Our Heavenly Father has given us ample time to repent, to believe, to obey, to be on the right side of things when all this goes down. But these movies portray these aliens as psychotic villain psychopaths right esteeming man's desire and wishes over our heavenly father's wishes his rule his authority right he made this place it's his right why this circle why the circle why the circle the circle why the circle right bringing a bunch of people up to it 
Strange lights descend on the city of Los Angeles, drawing people outside like moths to a flame where an extraterrestrial force threatens to swallow the entire human population off the earth. The fear of Yahuwah is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Why the circle? They're always making these people that come out of this circle thing out of the sky look like hideous creatures. The circle. The Tomorrow War. You know, that movie where the evil aliens work six days and rest on the seventh? That's right. The aliens have a Sabbath day. Neither let, the, neither let the son of the stranger that has joined himself to Yahuwah speak, saying, Yahuwah has utterly separated me from his people. Neither let the eunuchs say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says Yahuwah unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths and choose the things that please me and take hold of my covenant. Even unto them will I give in mine house and within my walls a place and a name better than of sons and of daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to Yahuwah to serve him and to love the name of Yahuwah, to be his servants, everyone that keeps the Sabbath from polluting it and takes hold of my covenant, even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices have been accepted upon mine altar, for mine house shall be called an house of prayer for all people. Isaiah 56, 3-7. through 7. Don't let anybody tell you that the Sabbath day is not important, because in some of these movies, the aliens are portrayed as Sabbath keepers. Uh, the the uh, video we shared with you at the beginning, The Coming War, You Are the Enemy, we talk a lot about this. The fifth wave, right? The circle, alien circle mothership city thing. The movie where the aliens take over the world and destroy it in multiple waves, right? Seals, trumpets, vials. The movie Signs. Why the circle? Having lost his religious faith after the horrific car accident that claimed the life of his wife, the emotionally broken former Episcopal priest, Graham Hess, retreats to a remote farm surrounded by corn in Pennsylvania to live with his two young children and younger brother. Six short months later, a sinister undercurrent of dread starts to take over a family when a mysterious crop circle formations appear in his field and the same circular patterns manifest all over the world more and more as equally unexplained happenings occur grief and denial mixed with paranoia making a highly volatile combination is this an elaborate hoax or an ominous sign from above or could it be indeed the end of the world as we know it so and it's what's interesting the reason i i, I share this is because in a lot of these movies right it is denying the existence of our father and proposing a belief in aliens. There was a chart, uh, a, um, a chart in an article I read not too long ago. Uh, I didn't put it in the study, but there's like, a, like, like belief in, in God is going down and belief in aliens is going up, right? And I think it's a perfect storm with all this brainwashing that's going on that that's exactly how Satan's going to gather all the world together to fight against our Messiah. They're going to think he's the enemy, the alien threat, right? And we're going to talk about also the good, bad alien dynamic, which we also see in these movies uh, like Transformers and Avengers. There's like a good set of superheroes and then there's a bad set of superheroes. There's a good set of aliens, there's a bad set of aliens. There's a good set of robots and a bad set of robots. And we'll talk about that because I think we know who the good robots are, but really biblically speaking, or the bad robots are obviously going to be Satan and his um, his uh, his kingdom. So why this circle? For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins, but a, a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. It's coming. It's coming for this world. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who has trodden underfoot the Son of Elohim, the Son of God, our Messiah, and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and has done despite unto the Spirit of grace? For we know him that said, Vengeance belongs unto me. I will recompense, right? My, our, our Heavenly Father will repay, says Yahuwah. And again, Yahuwah shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living Elohim. Hebrews 10, 26 through 31. So we want to be on the right side of these things when it comes down. 
Any of any of anybody ever play this game? Boy, I spent a lot of my life playing this game, Halo, the whole series. So it's even in video games, right? Why this circle? Super Soldier John one seventeen. I wonder what that that verse is. That's the one that goes right before no one has seen Elohim. Anyways, Master Chief of the United Nations Space Command must battle a genocidal alien race known as the, uh oh, the Covenant. Is that just a coincidence? Must battle a genocidal alien race known as the Covenant following his violent crash landing on Halo, an ancient and mysterious ring world. The Covenant is ran by prophets. The prophet of truth, and I think the other one that is a prophet of mercy and a prophet of regret. In any case, the covenant is ran by prophets, and the prophet of, of truth is being is one of them. Who is the prophet of truth? Our Messiah is the prophet of truth. They are mocking him. This is what they portray our Messiah to be like, like this hideous looking alien thing that is genocidal and crazed. Here's some of the quotes from that game. Prophet of truth. Soon the great journey shall begin, but when it does, the weight of your heresy shall stay at your feet, and you shall be left behind. Quite so, here rests the vanguard of the great journey, every arbiter from first to last, each one created and consumed in times of extraordinary crisis. Prophet of mercy, their slander offends all who walk the path. What path? Come on. The narrow path. Halo, its divine wind will rush through the stars, propelling all who are worthy along the path to salvation. And they make these aliens look crazy and stupid and genocidal and psychotic. And this is how Satan is brainwashing the people to hate Messiah at his coming. Prophet of truth, be glad. A reward for all your toil and all your sacrifices is in the year at hand. Come on. Who would doubt the prophets? What have they foretold that has not come to pass? They're taking scripture and tossing it into this. Whosoever is gripped by fear, take heed. I am the prophet of truth, and I am not afraid. Noble mercy is here at my side. His wise, wise counsel is ever in my ears. Come on. Those of you that know your Bible, you know what this game is doing. You know what these movies are doing. They're making our Messiah to be the crazed, alien, genocidal maniacs when... In fact, they're not. They have mercy and truth. They're patient with anybody that is willing to turn and repent of their ways and keep their commandments. To believe in the Son of, Son of God, the Son of Elohim, who gave up his life willingly for us, that we may be cleansed and washed. And people like us seem, are going to seem crazier and crazier as they continue to put these movies and games out. There are actually so many more about this, the, this whole circle thing and this agenda at hand. Right? We can keep going for hours. We really could. There are, right? While there are a few movies that depict other shapes in relation to aliens, you know, Stargate being one of them, as we mentioned before, the circle is the dominant one. So why the circle? Why is he training the world to be afraid of, reject, and ultimately fight against this circular spaceship thing coming down from the sky? Why has Satan been forcing this into the minds of the masses? Why do the nations rage? And the people imagine a vain thing. Why are, they, why are they thinking this crazy thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together, come together as one, against Yahuwah, our father, and against his anointed Messiah, his son, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us, right? Let us break free from them. And let's destroy them. He that sits in the heavens shall laugh. Yahuwah shall have them in derision, confusion, then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion, right? My Messiah, his Messiah, our Messiah, I'm sorry, his king. Wait, our king, his son, our Messiah. I will declare the decree. Yahuwah has said unto me, you are my son. This day I have begotten you. Ask of me and I shall give you the heathen or the nations for your inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession, right? And that's what all these movies tend to do. Is they think that, that they're alien threats coming to enslave the human population. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel, just like all these alien movies depict. They calm down and destroy. And you know what? He is going to come down and destroy because that is the judgment that is, that's the righteous judgment coming upon this earth. That was Psalm 2, 1 through 9. So now let's talk about really the why. Why this circle? Why all the brainwashing of this circle mothership coming out of the sky? The shape of New Jerusalem. 
If you search New Jerusalem, you'll likely have results like this, right? Cube, Cube City, Cube City, Cube City. Um, well, this is like Disneyland Cube City. I don't know why that's there. <laughs> but right, Square Cube City, Cube City, Cube City. At this point, regardless of where you are in your walk, you probably realize that most of what has been taught over the past 120 years is false on purpose. Likewise, I do believe that the true shape of New Jerusalem has also been veiled over the centuries. Why the cube? And the city lies four square. Right, it is, right? And the length, the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs, 1,500 miles. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. This is huge. Can you imagine? So Texas, I think, is like 750 or 770 miles wide. So it's literally like double that. It's like two Texases coming down out of the sky. That was Revelation 21.16. So it says it's four square and its length is as large as the breadth. And the height is also equal. So it makes sense for a cube, right? Seems like there's no further discussion needed. Four square, a cube. And it may indeed be. This huge cube may come out of the sky. Even though Hollywood portrays the circle, it may in fact come down as a big cube or pyramid as most of us have imagined. Because you can also, a pyramid, um, a pyramid can also be length, width, yeah, length, width, and height be the same. Length, width, and height can be the same for a cube, right? <clears throat> so even though Hollywood portrays the circle, it may in fact come down as a big cube or pyramid as most of us imagine. However, I'd like to put forth a few things to consider. I'd like to share a few passages from the Book of Enoch. If you're unfamiliar with it, here are a short here are a few short videos introducing it and why I believe it is scripture. It's not just, you know, good wisdom or good historical content. Oh, I believe the book of Enoch is scripture. It was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, preserved, right? right alongside the Bible. In short, Jude quoted it verbatim. He quoted the book of Enoch verbatim. Peter taught from it in 2 Peter and Messiah rebuked the Sadducees for not knowing the book of Enoch. So if you want to learn more about that, it's here about why I believe the book of Enoch is scripture. So anyways, let's talk about Enoch and the circle. What is that, right? The sun. And first there goes forth the great luminary called the sun, and his circumference is like the circumference of heaven, and he is quite filled with illuminating heat and fire, right? So the sun has a circumference. It's a circle. Wait, what? Did you catch that, though? Circumference is like the circumference of heaven. I don't know how many times I've read this passage, but it was like it jumped out at me this past week after a friend shared a picture of the moon and some thoughts regarding it. Thanks, brother. I think it was brother Mike, was it? Anyways, <clears throat> so, right, so this is what happens when you have a solar eclipse, right? You have the perfect circle sun, the perfect circle moon. As he rises, so he sets and decreases not and rests not, but runs day and night, and his light is sevenfold brighter than that of the moon. But as regards to size, they are both equal. Enoch 72, 37. If you didn't pick up what Enoch was putting down, here it is again, but for the moon. And after this, I saw another law dealing with a lesser luminary, which is named the moon, and her circumference is like the circumference of heaven. And her chariot in which she rides is driven by the wind, and light is given to her in definite measure, Enoch 30, um, 73, 1 through 2. So heaven has a circumference. So it says the moon has a circumference like the circumference of heaven. Heaven has a circumference. What is a circumference? The perimeter of a circle. These are the two great luminaries. Their circumference is like the circumference of heaven. And the size of the circumference of both is a like Enoch 77.3, the sun and the moon. If heaven has a circumference, then it is a circle. There is no circumference of squares, triangles those are different measurements there's one measurement for a circumference and it's a circle would that make sense in relation to the earth we'll come back to this concept momentarily so let's put a pin in this the circle of the earth there are two dominant theories or theologies even regarding the shape of the earth it's either this or this it is he who sits above the circle of the earth and the inhabitant, its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in. I know in the scriptures it says the four corners of the earth, but that word corners could also just mean borders, right? So the four could be the four directions of the earth, right? But clearly it says he who sits above the circle 
of the earth. And that word in the Hebrew circle is circle. So whether you believe the earth is this, because it's going to get tagged if I say that word, or a globe, his creation is circular, right? So if he looks down and it's this, right, or this, it's circular. Would we think heaven would be any different, especially considering all the heavenly bodies are circular, the sun, the moon, the stars? If he were to look down from heaven and see a globe, it would be a circle. If he looked down upon the earth, the such and such earth, it would be a circle. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth. Right? He set a compass upon the face of the depth. Proverbs 8, 27. <clears throat> praise, praise him, ye heavens of heavens and ye waters that are above the heavens. Psalm 148, 4. Right? There's waters above, there's waters below. And Elohim said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. And Elohim made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so, right? So our, the very first page of our Bible says that there's waters above. Well, modern day science teaches us that it's just a vacuum of blackness, of nothingness up there, right? But our scriptures say that there's waters above the heaven. And that there's something, there's something called a firmament that divides the waters above from the waters below firmament this is the hebrew word rakia firmament extended surface solid right it's solid ex expanse firmament flat as base support firmament of the vault of heaven supporting the waters above considered by hebrews as solid and supporting waters above the firmament apparently visible arch of the sky firmament if you've never looked into biblical cosmology i would encourage you to seek it out as satan has deceived the whole world here's a short playlist here is a short playlist that may bless you. There's a link right here. We won't be digging into that today. We're not going to be getting into biblical cosmology today. The point is, heaven and earth are both circles. So why would New Jerusalem be a cube or a pyramid? Right? Here's a little picture of um, this is Revelation 4, gathering around the throne. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment and they had on their heads crowns of gold revelation 4 4 here's the greek word for oh let's see of course my internet's not doing very well is it up nope camper life okay we'll get back to that in a second so anyways uh when you look at the greek word for round about the throne it really does mean round or circular uh, let's see if I can pull it up. And my internet is just not being nice. Aha! Kiklothen. Roundabout. Roundabout from all sides. An adverb from the same such and such from the circle all around. So this word is derived from this word. Uh, case of Kuklos, a ring, a cycle, roundabout, in a circle, right? A ring, a circle. So literally, the throne room is circular. So it seems that so much of his creation is circular or arched. What about the tabernacle in the wilderness? Isn't that a rectangle shape? The tabernacle. When you search the tabernacle in the wilderness, you'll almost always come up with this shoebox shape right? This is like the standard. Is that the truth? Perhaps. However, after finding the research done by an engineer and brother in the faith by the name of Andrew Hoy, I believe it's highly possible that it may have been a dome tent, much like the earth, a dome firmament. As many of us are digging into the word and realizing lies have been perpetrated regarding the truth of our walk of faith and obedience, Andrew took it even further. I'll leave you links for all his material if you decide to look into it further. The first to present his case sounds right until another comes along and examines him. Proverbs 18, 17. So here's a link for his website, for his YouTube channel, and here's the specific video where I found him with Rob Skiba right here. If the tabernacle was a circular dome, which, hey, I think he presents a, an excellent case, but what do I know? I'm definitely not an engineer, so I don't know. If the tabernacle was a circular dome, Satan would have many reasons to cover it up, much like he does with the very earth that we live on. So, New Jerusalem dimensions. 
1,500 miles by 1,500 miles, right? Wide length and width, right? And the city lies four square, and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs, 15,000 miles. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal, Revelation 21, 16. The book of Revelation tells us New Jerusalem measures 1,500 miles for its length and width and height. The image above makes sense and works. So does this. So imagine, so that's that same square from up here. But now if we put a circle in it, we can get the same length and width. Can we not? What about height? Right Here's your standard cube. It could be 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles. That makes sense. So could this. This is just a picture of a dome, but I'm just trying to show you that the length, the width, and the height could be the same if it was a highly arched dome. Something like this, but maybe even a higher arch. It could have the same length, width, and height. The arch or dome is one of the strongest shapes in architecture. It is often debated that either the triangle or circular shape is king. But you'll see this arch shape quite often in these bridges. Why? Because it's strong. It's definitely the arch and the triangle are definitely way stronger than a cube. So... I believe it's either going to be a pyramid or or, or a uh, a dome arched circle. He said, let the earth be made and it was made. Let the heaven be made and it was made. At his word, the stars were fixed and he knows the number of the stars. It is he who searches the deep and its treasures, who has measured the sea and its contents, who has enclosed the sea in the midst of the waters, right? It has an enclosure. And by his word has suspended the earth over the water, who has spread out the heaven like an arch and founded it upon the waters. That's 2 Ezra 16, 55-59. I think it is highly possible that New Jerusalem will, will come down as a circular dome. If this is the case, this is why I believe media is pitching the evil cir circle city slash mothership agenda. Right? Why this big circle comes out of the sky. After all, think about the typical narrative in these movies. Independence Day is a perfect example. A huge alien mothership comes to destroy the world and take it over. The people of the earth put down their differences and unite to destroy the common enemy. Our Messiah will be coming down with his city out of heaven to take over the earth as it is, 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 it is his right. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant. Remember that... Uh, uh, Halo game, right? The Covenant, the, the evil aliens are called the Covenant. Keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. If our Messiah, if all things were made through the hands of our Messiah, our Heavenly Father, through His Word, our Messiah, then the earth is His. It's His earth. That was Exodus 19.5. The earth is Yahuwah's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Psalm 24.1. He will be coming with fire and vengeance as it is the righteous judgment of Yahuwah our Father. It is Satan's job to spin the story to deceive the nations into fighting against him, thinking he's a villain or alien threat. Right? He's coming with fire and vengeance. A voice of noise from the city, a voice from the temple, a voice of Yahuwah that renders recompense to his enemies. Before she travailed, she brought forth. Before her pain came, she was delivered of a man-child. Right? This is the nation who has heard such a thing, who has seen such things. Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day, or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. This is New Jerusalem and her children, right? The righteous people. Shall I bring to the birth and not cause to bring forth, says Yahuwah? Shall I cause to bring forth and shut the womb, says your Elohim? Rejoice ye with Jerusalem, New Jerusalem, and be glad with her, all you that love her. Rejoice for joy with her, all you that mourn for her, that you may suck and be satisfied with the breasts of her consolations, that you may milk out and be delighted with the abundance of her glory. For thus says Yahuwah, Behold, I will extend peace to her like a river, and the glory of the nations like a flowing stream. Then you shall suck, you shall be born upon her sides, and be dandled upon her knees. As one whom his mother comforts, so will I comfort you, and you shall be comforted in Jerusalem, New Jerusalem. And when you see this, your heart shall rejoice, and your bones shall flourish like an herb, and the hand of Yahuwah shall be known toward his servants, and his indignation towards his enemies. So kind of like how we saw when Satan falls down, the kingdom comes down. It's time. It's over. For behold, Yahweh will come with fire and his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by his sword will Yahweh plead with all flesh and the slain of Yahweh shall be many. 
They that sanctify themselves and purify themselves in the gardens behind one tree in the midst, eating swine's flesh, pork, and the abomination and the mouse shall be consumed together. This is prophetic. This hasn't happened yet. He hasn't come and destroyed all the nations yet. When he's coming, he says he's going to destroy people that eat pork. You may have been taught all your life that everything is clean. You can eat whatever you want. I really wish I would have left some, um, um, some resources here for you. But I'll try to leave a link in the description box for that as well. If, in case I don't, search 119 Ministries, Acts chapter 10. Or 119 Ministries, All Foods Clean any case so they'll be consumed together for I know their works and their thoughts that shall come that I will gather all nations and tongues and they shall come and see my glory Isaiah 66 6 through 18 in this passage we see the return of our king with his kingdom New Jerusalem at the same time he miraculously gathers his people to his kingdom this will be visible to all the nations and will be bigger than the first exodus event see Jeremiah 16 and 23 to the world this will provo provoke thoughts of alien abductions i don't know what this exactly is going to look like i don't know if it's going to look like this but this big circular city that's going to come out of the sky is going to gather people together before the destruction comes is it going to look like this i don't know like that i don't know is it going to look like this maybe it's always portrayed as something you wouldn't want happening to you think about it right this could be the real reason for Project Bluebeam. We'll talk about that a little bit later, maybe. A counter-narrative to the actual event, maybe. Perhaps they could stage a false version of the real event before it happens. So, you know, Project Bluebeam talks about the government having the ability to make stuff like this happen in the sky. I think it's counter-narrative. Personally, I think that the whole thought of Project Bluebeam is to cover up what actually happens because what happens if Yahweh comes down Messiah comes down with a city and gathers people together like this right what are they going to say well they could say either it's an alien, alien abduction people got abducted they could say oh it was just fake it was just project blue beam I don't know I, I don't know everything I really definitely don't perhaps also they could stage a false version of the real event before it happens I don't know but think about it. in all these movies right when people are gathered together like everybody's like, oh no, right? They're dead, or they're they're gonna be abducted and tortured, or whatever. But the reality, this big circle thing's gonna come out of the sky and they're gonna gather his righteous people, and it's gonna be joy for them. We also see that when this happens, our heavenly Father's righteous judgment comes upon the earth, the great tribulation. This is the general theme of most alien movies. Anybody watch? I think was this Avengers? I can't remember. Remember Loki? He says, kneel before me. I said, kneel. Is this not simpler? Is this not your natural state? It's the unspoken truth of humanity that you crave subjec subjug subjugation. Sorry, The bright lure of freedom diminishes your life's joy in a mad scramble for power, for identity. You are made to be ruled. In the end, you will always kneel. So they're taking the truth of, I have, right, this is obviously a stab at our Messiah. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone forth out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear. So they're taking that and spinning it into this maniacal, just crazed killer that wants, you know, power, everybody to kneel to him, right? However, this is our Messiah. I mean, we should, our Messiah, our Heavenly Father, they are our creators, right? And, you know, it's making people like us seem crazy to want to kneel before him i don't know about you i want to lie on my face before him i want my face to be on the ground before him because i love him so much because you know what? he saved a disgusting person like me from my sins and gave me eternal life through belief and he showed me how to walk in his commandments in love and in truth and spirit and i'm forever grateful and i'd be, I'd be happy to kneel before him and bow before him they make our Father and Messiah seem like bloodthirsty, psychotic villains, yet this is the earth they have made and given us ample time to repent and turn to him through faith and obedience. And he said to me, You are not a better judge than Elohim, or wiser than the Most High. 
Let many perish who are now living rather than that the Torah, the law of Elohim, which is set before them, be disregarded. For Elohim strictly commanded those who came into the world when they came what they should do to live and what they should observe to avoid punishment. Nevertheless, they were not obedient and spoke against him. They devised for themselves vain thoughts, right? Vain thoughts and proposed themselves wicked frauds. They even declared that the Most High does not exist and they ignored his ways, right? Aliens! They scorned his Torah, his law, his commandments, and denied his covenants. They have been unfaithful to his statutes and have not performed his works. Therefore, Ezra, empty things are for the empty and full things are for the full. To Ezra 7, 19-25, I really know why this book was removed. I said, un I said therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins, for if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. John 8, 24, the office is talking about our Messiah. His judgment is righteous and true. These movies attempt to get you to second guess his character. Who shall not fear you, O Yahuwah, and glorify your name? For you only are holy. For all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments are made manifest. Revelation 15.4 Anybody that remembers um, Independence Day, remember this scene? They're on top of the building and they're like, Yay, aliens, oh, you're here. You know, did you bring back Elvis? Oh, you know. Hollywood makes people who welcome this coming look like crazed fools. Back to the circle, right? Remember this? How long will you go about, O backsliding daughter? For Yahuwah has created a new thing in the earth. A woman shall compass a man. This is New Jerusalem, 30, Isaiah 31, 22. The Hebrew word sabab, compass, right? To turn about and circle. To make a circuit, to go around, surround, and compass. The woman is New Jerusalem, and she will compass his people. So, Planet X, Nibiru. The Planet X Nibiru theory is about a distant planet that could one day come into our atmosphere and kill everything. Sound familiar? If New Jerusalem is a circular dome, what would it look like as it approached the Earth? Wouldn't it look like what they portray as another planet coming into our atmosphere? Here is a quick visual of what it may look like. Uh, let's see, where is it? Give me just a moment. Uh, I think this is it. Thanks, Brother Arthur, for making that. We were talking about uh, Arthur's uh, um, graphic designer that helps me with um, a lot of stuff behind the scenes. In any case, um, we were talking about this, and it's like, what would New Jerusalem, if it was circular, let's just hypothesize, if it was circular, what would it come, what would it look like as it approached in the earth? And maybe that's just a, maybe that's a uh, an idea of what it may look like. And maybe that's why we see, you know, things like this and, and um, right, perhaps... This is also the reason Planet X or Nibiru is perpetrated. If a circle dome descends from above, it could be mistaken or passed off as another planet coming into our atmosphere, right? It's moving into our atmosphere, right? Remember the Death Star, right? Remember this thing in Star Wars? Wouldn't it be like the Death Star? Would New Jerusalem could be passed off as like a Death Star uh, enemy? This big circular thing that comes into our atmosphere that has a throne room that wants to take over the planet and and you know destroy many many of the um sinful inhabitants i don't know heaven and earth are about to collide 
right? Maybe it looked like something like that coming in, like this big heavenly body. <clears throat> I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Mount Zion is New Jerusalem, right? When Messiah comes down with his city and kingdom, one of the first things we see is the destruction of Mystery Babylon. Some people believe Mystery Babylon is America, some London, others Rome. Some believe it's a city up in, in the sky. Here is why I believe it's Jerusalem. How, honestly, regardless of where it is, you can, can you imagine what the world will think when a big city comes down from above and destroys an entire city or state or country or territory? Remember Ronald Reagan's words? I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. So here's a few verses later in Revelation 14 when we see Messiah on top of Mount Zion with 144,000, saying with a loud voice, Fear Elohim and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Revelation 14, 7 through 8. For my current understanding and opinion, the fall of mystery Babylon will be the catalyst used to unite the world together. <clears throat> Let's talk about Revelation 18 and Babylon, or the fall thereof. After these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. Revelation 18.1 If an angelic type of person or creature or Elohim God <clears throat> were to come down and light the whole earth with his glory, who do you think this would be? This is the same scene as this. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head. And his face was as it were the sun and his feet as pillars of fire. Let's be honest with each other. This is talking about our Messiah. And he had in his hand a little book open, which only he could open in Revelation chapter 5. And he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roars. Lion of the tribe of Judah. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven, and swore by him that lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are therein, and the earth and the things that are therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer Time's up. Revelation 10, 1 through 6. Time's up. Remember Independence Day? When the aliens had communicated that a certain time, Earth is over. Right? And he had, this, this guy uh, had a countdown sequence. And when the timer went to zero, he said, time's up. And literally seconds later, destruction started happening on the Earth. So our Messiah is going to stand up and say, Time is up. Vengeance is here. So what was this scene depicting? For I lift up my hand to heaven. Remember we saw that? I lifted up his hand to heaven. For I lift up my hand to heaven and I say I live forever. If I wet my glittering sword and mine hand take hold of judgment, I will render vengeance to my enemies and will reward them that hate me. I will make mine arrows drunk with blood and my sword shall devour flesh. And that with the blood of the slain of the captives from the beginning of revenges upon the enemy. Rejoice, O you nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants and will render vengeance to his adversaries and will be merciful unto his land and unto his people. And this is what we see time and time again. When heaven comes down to earth, Earth, there's going to be goodness and joy and pet and peace and rest for his people and it's going to be a nightmare for the rest of the world the world that was deuteronomy 30 to 40 40 through 43 now let's see this judgment so let's go we're going back to revelation 18 1 so we're going now back to and after these things i saw another angel come down from heaven having great power and the earth was lightened with his glory and he, uh, and he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and Elohim has remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her, double according to her works, and the cup which she has filled to her double. We learn about this in Ezekiel 22 through 23. 
How much she has glorified herself and lived deliciously. So much torment and sorrow give her. For she says in her heart, I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire. For strong is Yahweh Elohim who judges her. And now here you go. The kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her right, and lament with her. And they shall see the smoke of her burning stand afar off for the fear of her torment, torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is your judgment calm. That was Revelation 18, 2 through 10. So the world's going to mourn, but his people is going to rejoice when Babylon is just annihilated, wherever it is. Whether it's Jerusalem, whether it's America, London, um, what if it's a ton of cities? Like in Independence Day, what if it's a bunch of cities that all act like Babylon all at the same time? And cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? And they cast dust on their heads, right? They're mourning and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, that great city wherein were made rich all that had ships by the reason of her costliness. For in one hour is she made desolate. Rejoice over her, you heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for Elohim has avenged you on her. Revelation 18, 18 through 20. So why would the prophets, right, and his people rejoice? And in her, Mystery Babylon, was found the blood of the prophets and of saints and all that were slain upon the earth. Revelation 18, 24. Which land is responsible for all this? Is it Rome? Is it America? Is it London? That upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zechariah, son of Barachias, whom you kill between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you that kill the prophets and stone them which are sent unto you, how often I would gather your children together, even as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, and you would not. Matthew twenty three, thirty five through thirty seven. So for more on this, please this please see this study regarding Mystery Babylon. So what is the significance of the angel or messenger coming with a rainbow above his head? Because we saw that, right? We saw that, uh, where was it? Right? We saw Messiah come clothed with a cloud, rainbow upon his head, and his face was as was the sun, his feet as pillars of fire. So what is the significance of a rainbow upon his head? And this is all going to tie in together. I, know you may, I may be losing you here. I apologize if I am, but it's important. So why, what is the significance of the angel or messenger coming with a rainbow above his head? And the foundations of the wall of the city, this is New Jerusalem, were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third a chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth a sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh a chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth a topaz, the tenth a chrysoprasus, the eleventh a jacinth, the twelfth an amethyst. Revelation 21, 19-20, describing New Jerusalem. I know we've showed this a lot in our studies recently, but this is important. Let's take a look at this real quickly about what those stones do. New Jerusalem, it said, is built made up of 12 precious stones that we would make into jewelry now. Now here's the fascinating thing which to me is the final proof that that book is the Word of God, that it must be God-inspired. In the last generation only, we've discovered how to make purer light than we had before. Most light is bouncing around, waves crashing into each other, going in all directions, so that the light coming from that spotlight still lights this side of my face by reflecting off that, that tinsel up there. Um, we're used to light coming at us from all directions. But we've now discovered how to send light in one direction. Laser light is the most common. You've seen laser light beams straight as a die. But we've also got what we call cross-polarized light. A polarized filter, if you can imagine, allows light through like that. But if you put another polarized filter at right angles to that, you've really got a very fine filter. If you take sunglasses, and take one lens and put it at right angles to the other, it goes even darker. It only lets very straight light through. Now, people have taken jewels and precious stones and cut a very thin slice for microscopic purposes and then shone cross-polarized light through them to see what happens. To put it very crudely, 
what happens to these precious stones in pure light? And one of two entirely different things happens with every jewel. The technical term, to give you a bit of science for a moment, is anisotropic jewels and isotropic jewels. Now what happens is this. Some jewels in pure light, whatever their color to begin with, they may be red, blue or green, turn into all the colors of the rainbow and the most fantastic patterns. Other precious stones in pure light lose all their color, just go black, look like a lump of coal dust. And it's only in the last, this generation that people have discovered this unusual property. For example, diamonds in pure light are nothing. Did you get that, ladies? They're not even... that? Diamonds, nothing. nothing. They won't be there. <laughs> no, so make the most of them here. <coughs> Rubies, uh, garnets, just lose everything. Emeralds? No, they keep it. Oh, good. There are other stones that are anisotrope. We can go into these beautiful colors. Now, here's the fascinating thing. The 12 precious stones that God uses to build the new Jerusalem are all anisotropic. In pure light, they are all far more beautiful. And God doesn't touch the diamonds or the rubies. He doesn't build with them. Now, let's just put on the screen a picture of these stones. Yeah. Look at the top 12 stones on this picture and you'll see the stones of the New Jerusalem. Look at the four bottom ones at the bottom of the picture and you'll see they're black, no attraction, whatever. Now then, who knew this 2,000 years ago? No scientist knew it, nobody knew it. John the Apostle writing the, down the book of Revelation as the Lord dictated it to him, he didn't know. Nobody knew except one person in the entire universe, and he knew, and that was God himself. Where is that written exactly? Revelation 21, right. halfway through, and you'll find all the 12 stones listed there. And you can just imagine from the picture we've seen on the screen how beautiful the new Jerusalem is going to be. No need for do-it-yourself decoration or changing rooms there. No need. The materials that God uses will be fabulous. From verse 19, 21 right. verse 19. Read them out. Uh, the first foundation was jasper. Yeah. The, uh, the, the second, sapphire. The third, chalcedony. The fourth, emerald. The fifth, sardonyx. The sixth, uh, carnelian. The seventh, chrysolite. The eighth, beryl. The ninth, topaz. The tenth, Chrysoprase, or chrysoprase, chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth, uh, the twelfth amethyst. No diamonds, no rubies, no garnets, because they're and they're isotropic. Mm. Now, isn't that amazing? To me, that one thing alone would prove that the Bible was inspired by God, because nobody could have known this. They didn't know it until our generation. So imagine this. <clears throat> imagine this. So remember in 2 Ezra 13, we wrote, we wrote or read, and I looked and behold, he carved out for himself a great mountain and flew up upon it. And I tried to see the region or place from which the mountain was carved, but I could not. And after this, I looked and behold, all who gathered together against him to wage war with him were much afraid yet dared to fight. So we also remember this. Let's go back here. Uh, where is it? Let's go back right here. Um... And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. So imagine this. If we know that Messiah says that he is the light. So if these these simple machines, not simple machines, but these sh machines that we can make on earth that were created to figure out that these 12 gemstones in New Jerusalem, when pure light was shown through them, that would shine the rainbow, well, how much even more would New Jerusalem shine like a rainbow if the light of Messiah, right, at the light of Messiah was lightened with his or was lightened with his glory, right? So the earth was lightened with his glory. So imagine the light of Messiah shining through New Jerusalem, producing the rainbow, right? So it's going to look pretty wild when he comes down. People aren't going to understand it. So this brings us to Enoch fifty-five, 
And after that, the head of days repented and said, In vain have I destroyed all who dwell on the earth. And he swore by his great name. Henceforth, so from this time forth, this is talking about the flood of Noah's day. I will not do so to all who dwell on the earth. So he's like, I'm not going to destroy with the flood again. I'm not going to destroy all the people on the earth again. And I will set a sign in the heaven. This is the bow in the cloud. And this shall be a pledge of the good faith between me and them forever. This is the rainbow set in the cloud as the sign of the covenant. So long as heaven is above the earth. Everything we've learned today, the new Jerusalem is heaven. It comes down here. And when it comes down, it's going to light as a rainbow. So the Most High set this decree that he will not destroy the earth so long as heaven is above earth. And until then, he's going to set the bow in the cloud as a faithful promise. But when that day is over, he's going to come down. Because here's what's going to happen. The heaven is supposed to be rolled up like a scroll. So the arch, the firmament foundation, it's going to be rolled away. That's no longer going to shine forth. I'll show you in just a second. Any case, so when the real rainbow comes down, New Jerusalem, that's when time's up. It's over. That's when he's going to, he's, he's promised to bring destruction again. Or that he wouldn't destroy the whole earth until that time. The rainbow will be seen on earth until the time is up. Then the real rainbow will come down with our Messiah, bringing vengeance to his enemies and peace to his people. So here's the good, bad alien portrayal. We were talking a little bit about this earlier. I mentioned it earlier. In a lot of these movies, right? In movies like Transformers, the Avengers series, and many others, there's a set of good superhuman beings, or aliens, gods, whatever, and a set of bad ones. They typically make our father and his son the bad guys, of course, and make the fallen angels, the watchers, and even Satan look like the heroes just wanting to protect humanity from extinction. Now, I watched this movie. Uh, it's the first movie I've watched in a long time, uh, at least a Hollywood movie, and... Um, Boy, I want my three hours back. It was, I just felt dirty after watching it. I'm just going to be honest with you. I don't recommend it at all. Um, the only thing I really grasped from here is these are like the fallen angels who were here on Earth since the beginning, and all they wanted to do is teach man technology and and, um, and protect them, which is lies, of course. All they wanted to do is be disobedient to our Father and against His ways. And, of course, here we see the circles. You know, It's just, just a constant barrage of circles. And in those days, the angels shall return and hurl themselves to the east upon the Parthians and the Medes, right, to cause war, Enoch 56.4. These are the Transformers movies, right, of the good, the good robots and the bad robots. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angel fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. So when Messiah said, I saw Satan fall as lightning, that was prophesying. That was not a past event. This is a future event because we know that, you know, Satan still had access in heaven, you know, with, with Job and, and accusing him and things like that. So his place won't be found anymore in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So when he comes down here, do you think he's going to be like, yeah, I'm the devil and these are my angels? Or what do you, come on, we're smarter than that. He's, of course, he's going to be the other aliens or other, uh, the good aliens, right? Is what a lot of these movies portray or the good robots or the, the good intelligence or whatever it is that wants to come here and protect us from the real big and bad enemies that's coming really soon. You know, it says he has 42 months, but that's why I believe there's this good, bad portrayal in a lot of these movies, right? The good, bad, like these Avengers, these superhuman strength these are more than likely the watchers or or um you know satan and his angels that have probably amazing superpowers oh, amazing is the wrong word but these grand superpowers right and they portray fighting against the big bad enemy that wants to come in and enslave or destroy the world and that's the that's the whole theme so when Satan's cast out, I heard a loud voice in heaven saying now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our Elohim it's coming your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation or into the tribulation and deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Does that sound familiar? So when Satan's cast down, you literally have heaven coming down to earth. Two kingdoms coming down. Satan's kingdom and our Messiah's kingdom coming down to earth. And Satan has been preparing the world to accept his and to reject our messiahs so now when satan's cast down now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our elohim and the power of his messiah for the accuser of our brethren is cast down which accused them before our elohim day and night just like we saw in the book of job he accused job 
Revelation 12, 7 through 10. So remember, when Satan and his angels become visible on this earth, they will conspire against and speak blasphemy against the Messiah and his kingdom, gathering the world together to fight against it. This is why they portray these superhumans wanting to assemble and fight the big bad guy in the sky or that's coming. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against Elohim to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. The tabernacle is heaven. It's New Jerusalem. It's his kingdom. Right? So they're going to say, look, there it is, the enemy. New Jerusalem is the tabernacle. Right? He's going to blaspheme his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from Elohim out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of Elohim is with men, and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people, and Elohim himself shall be with them, and be their Elohim. Revelation 21, 2-3. through 3. Most of us have been taught that New Jerusalem comes at the end, after the thousand-year reign. However, with much love and respect to this understanding, I believe this to be incorrect. Here are some resources for you if you'd like to test this for yourself. And when I made this a couple years ago, I still thought I was a cube. So there it is. <laughs> Just a couple of videos for you to watch. So the fake alien invasion. This is Werner von Braun. WikiLeaks puts put forth this document sharing the words of the late Werner von Braun, an ex-Nazi scientist that the U.S. recruited after World War II, typo, sorry, for its rocket program. Here's the transcript. I met the late Dr. Warner Von Braun in early 74 at the time, at that time, Von Braun was dying of cancer, but he assured me that he would live a few more years in order to tell me about the game that was being played. That game being the effort to weaponize space to control Earth from space and space itself. What was most interesting to me was a repetitive sentence that he said to me over and over again that was the strategy, now listen to this, <laughs> The strategy that was being used to educate the public and decision, decision makers and the scare tactics, the spin that was being put on as justification for our advanced weapon system, was based upon how we identify the enemy. The enemy at first, Von Braun said, to justify our space-based weapon systems, first the Russians are going to be considered the enemy, then terrorists would be identified, then we were going to identify third world crazies, the next enemy was asteroids, and against asteroids we're going to build space-based weapons. And the funniest one of all was against what he called aliens, extraterrestrials, that would be the final card. And over and over and over, during the four years that I knew him and was giving his speeches for him, he would bring up that last card. And remember, Carol, the last card is the alien card. We're going to have to build space-based weapons against aliens, and all of it, he said, is a lie. Why? It's because I think our I think Werner, Werner von Braun uh, may have understood our Heavenly Father in his last days. I'll share that with you in a second. Is there a possibility that powerful groups that control governments will use extraterrestrial phenomenon to deceive the masses? Given everything we've seen with false flag terrorism so far, it certainly seems plausible. And this is kind of interesting because in the last couple of years, there's lots of videos coming out of all these crazy lights in the sky. What is it? Is it the government doing it to perpetrate this, cons consistently perpetrate this alien agenda? Could it actually be the devil and his angels? Could it be um, spirits moving around in heaven? Who knows? But there's certainly an agenda at hand. It's interesting to note that Dr. Von Braun made sure that Psalm 19.1 was engraved on his tombstone, signifying he knew about the truth of the firmament that our Creator made. There are no aliens or other planets with extraterrestrials. It's only Elohim with his kingdom and Satan with his. So this is Werner Von Braun's tombstone, Psalm 19.1. The heavens declare the glory of Yahuwah, and the firmament shows his handiwork. He was in charge of the rocket program. He found out that rockets aren't penetrating into the space because there is a dome firmament that covers it. If that sounds crazy to you, please look at that uh, playlist that we shared earlier in the study about the biblical cosmology. Look familiar? So until this rolls up like a scroll... Because this, I believe, is what allows this to actually happen. The sun, the firmament, and when it's rolled up like a scroll and heaven comes down to earth, that's no longer going to be here. This rainbow will no longer happen, but the true rainbow is going to shine forth coming down. So this may be completely unrelated, two suns, 
But there has been an interesting phenomenon in the skies as of late. People seem to have taken pictures portraying two suns, and it's not lens flare. Listen, I took a photograph, uh, a photography 101 class in, uh, in graphic design school, so I know what I'm talking about. No, I'm just kidding. But I do know what lens flare is. And at first, I'm just like, this is just lens flare. Come on. But you look over and over, and it's just like, what is that? Why is that? That's not lens flare. That's not the. That's not the moon. Could somebody? Because here, this is like this is, this is not, that's not lens flare. But this is like that double exposure glare thing. <clears throat> what is that? It could be some phenomenon. But you can see here, like this. I mean, maybe is are all these photoshopped? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. I'm not sure. But I just know that there is hundreds, if not thousands, of these. Right. And given what we shared before, right? Could that be this? Could this be the beginning of it? I don't know. I don't know. But something's going on here, and I don't know what it is. I can't put my finger on it. Is am I saying that that's New Jerusalem coming? I don't know. I don't think so. It's possible, but that's not my conclusion at this time. I just felt led to just share this, just because. There's something up with that, and I don't, I can't quote, quite put my finger on it. I don't know. So let's talk about the real wisdom behind all this. The real wisdom. With evidence, with the evidence put forth today, I would consider New Jerusalem being a circular dome very likely. But who really knows, right? The topics like this and many others are fun to toss around. But at the end of the day, what really matters is our faith and walk with our Creator. Do you seek the Father diligently? Have you been washed of your sins by the blood of the Lamb, the Son of Elohim? Have you repented of what you've done? Will you be able to enter New Jerusalem regardless of its shape? If you're not sure, please see this study. Will you enter the kingdom? If you're very new and just waking up to truth in general, please see the playlist below. This will take you step by step. If you're like brand new and you're like, I know this world is just full of lies and I just know the Bible's true. I know the Messiah is true. He saved me from my sins. Um... Our Heavenly Father is true. I want to be in His kingdom. I don't want to be in the, the devil's kingdom. I want to be marked by our Heavenly Father and protected from this uh, disaster that's coming on upon the earth. I want to serve Him in spirit and truth. I want to serve Him the way He wants to be served. I know that even the churches teach lies these days. Then this playlist is for you. Because remember, many are called, few are chosen. Matthew twenty two fourteen. If you want to be one of the few who are called and chosen, it's time to repent of your sins. 1 John 3, 4 defines what sin is. It's transgression of the law, of the Torah. Believe in our Messiah and his offering for our lives. Dust off those scriptures and start reading, praying, and setting your life in accordance with our Messiah and his ways. Otherwise, you may find yourself on the wrong side of all this when it goes down. My little children, these things I write unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Yahusha, the Messiah, the righteous, and he is the atonement for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. And hereby we do know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. Don't let anybody lie to you. He that says, I know him, and keeps not his commandments, as a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whosoever keeps his word in him, verily, is the love of Elohim, the love of God perfected. And hereby we know that we are in him. He that says that he lives, or abides in him, ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. And how did he walk? He walked obedient to the commandments of the Torah. I know modern day Christianity says the law is done away with and it's a burden and nobody can do it and he did it so that we didn't have to do it and he fulfilled it and all these kind of things. I'm here to tell you that we've inherited lies, brothers and sisters. And if you still believe those things, please, I would encourage you to read, to watch this playlist. They're filled with lots of short, short videos. A few more long, but some of them are short. Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard from the beginning. 1 John 1, 1 through 7. So regardless of what comes upon this earth, right? It says in the book of Luke that men's hearts will fail them for fear and for looking after the things which are come upon the earth. Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Matthew 10, 28. Fear None but him, brothers and sisters. May Yahuwah bless you and keep you. Yahuwah make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Yahuwah lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom, give you peace. Shalom, brothers and sisters. I pray that you're able to learn and uh, glean something from this. Um, 
Let's end with prayer. Heavenly Father, Most High, Yahuwah, we come before you in your Son, Yahushua's name, and thank you for allowing us to see truth in these last days, the truth of your Son, Messiah, the truth of your word and your goodness and your commandments, the truth of your second coming, Messiah, and how this world is going to mourn and reject you and fight against you, but your servants also will be known in that time and be protected and brought to you, Father. We pray that we are on the right side of these things, Father, because we fear you and we fear you alone. Help us to keep your ways. Open eyes and ears through this study, Father, that we, your true remnant, the true children of Israel, grafted in through faith or regrafted in through faith in Messiah, will be ready at his second coming. Father, we love you and bless you in Messiah Yahushua's name. Amen. And hallelujah, brothers and sisters. I pray that this was a blessing for you. And uh, let's end with a song. Let's do this one. The Seed of Abraham. We know that we're the Seed of Abraham by faith in Messiah. Galatians 3. Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.
Finally returning